He made me see the wonder of tomorrow and how foolish to regret my yesterdays. He taught me how to take my deepest sorrows and use them to build a new today. He told me how success grows out of failure, to have faith in me and everything I do, to live by kindness, honesty and courage, and above all, to my own self be true. I thank you for giving me a world where I belong, where even I, who cannot sing, can understand the song. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You'll hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Who do you turn to during those special highs and lows in your life? That special someone who gives you solace, who listens without judgment, who seems to understand exactly what you're feeling and has that almost magical power to express it perfectly in words, especially when words seem to fail you. For me, it's someone who has been there before, during and after all of my life's critical times, from falling in love, marriage, divorce, the arrival of a newborn, or the passing of a loved one. In the quiet times and in the lonely times, the times when I need to be alone with my thoughts, but I seek comfort, compassion and clarity from someone who's always there to turn to, who is near and dear without prejudice. For you, it may be a parent, a good friend, a counsellor, or maybe just a barman with a listening ear. For me, it's always been getting lost in music or carefully crafted words. Words that capture the essence of a moment and help me to think, reflect and gain insight. You see, for me, words have real power. They can light fires in our minds or wring tears from the hardest hearts. And for me, the best words have always been the thoughts of Nanushka. They're a collection of thoughts on all of life's trials and tribulations that just seem to perfectly capture the emotions of the moment. I've read and reread them continuously over the years, and her dog-eared pages constantly enlighten me and soothe my soul with intuitive insights and warm wisdom. Now, I've never been a big fan of typical poetry, but I've always been a big fan of insightful words. Words that really make you think and just seem to capture the essence of every day as well as those special moments. Let me share my favourite definition of perfection. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And in this light, the thoughts of Nanushka capture the absolute epitome of emotional and soul-searching perfection. As Nanushka says, why do some people use so many words to say absolutely nothing? Like a silent inner voice, Nanushka has always been beside me and quietly guiding me. Like a constant companion whose empathy and wisdom always just seems to have the right words for every situation. I've been turning to the thoughts of Nanushka now for nearly 30 years, 
and ever since I first turned her heartwarming prophetic pages, I've always wanted to meet their diviner, Nan Whitcomb. I've always been in awe of her tender words and her touching talent, like a best friend that I've never met. Well, today is a very special one, as you get to share our very first meeting. And as you enjoy our conversation, I want you to remember that Nan is now in her 90s, but you'd never know it when hearing her bright and bubbly tones, a voice full of life, love and laughter, and filled with vitality as she continues to enjoy her golden years. And as you enjoy her story, you'll come to appreciate, as Sonia and I did, that Nan has invested her whole life in expressing her heart in words. And she's swung backwards and forwards on the emotional pendulum between the extremes of love and loneliness. And I admire and respect Nan now even more, if that's even possible, as I've come to appreciate that Nan has invested in true love without compromise. And as you listen, you'll learn that Nan fell in love, and I mean totally and deeply in love, quite early. But due to the twists and turns of fate, that love was not able to be. So Nan has spent the rest of her life looking for another taste of that special once-in-a-lifetime love at first sight and love forever connection. But it's never meant to be. As Nan once laughingly said, I've loved lots and lots and lots of men. But it was romantic love. It wasn't all physical, otherwise I would have died of exhaustion. Now, while many others before me have observed that Nan fell in love with falling in love, with the countless suitors that she's enchanted over the years, no one has ever been able to replace that depth of feelings from true love's first embrace. And I think, deep down, that Nan still holds out a candle for her first true flame. So now I admire her even more, because she's never been prepared to compromise on true, enduring love. Now, while many others learn to accept less, Nan would rather embrace life alone than settle for second best. And so, so she's tasted love with many, but falling short, has never married and chosen to remain single. Nan, you're one of the last true romantics. Now, I think this is why her words are her way of capturing and expressing so perfectly her timeless and enduring thoughts on all things between love, loss and loneliness, and all of the full rainbow of emotions in between. For this reason, I've broken up our heartwarming conversation with some of my favourite readings of her words, so that you too can be touched by them and start to appreciate them. Nan, I hope I do them the justice they deserve. As she says, Nanushka lives within each of us, belongs to everyone, and yet no one. Perhaps Nanushka is part of you. Nan's words have been repeated countless times all over the world over the last 50 years to celebrate and commemorate really important life events, including things like to mourn too long for those we love at the funeral of Michael Hutchins of NXS, and her poem Beautiful Unlined Faces was also published in Dr Charmaine Saunders' book Teenagers in Stress, just to name a few. Now, her 18 volumes of The Thoughts of Nanushka, published between 1971 and 1998, have sold over 300,000 copies worldwide. Her friends often say she's really about 17 different people in one. Now, her heart's poetic pulse has captured generations of lifelong followers like myself. And I know that you will too when you take the time to turn her pages. Now, there's only a very small handful of the Thoughts of Nanushka volumes left in existence. So if you're interested, please email me on bushy at khgroup.com.au. That's bushy at khgroup.com.au. If you'd like to be one of the last to own her enduring words, as they are absolutely destined to become prized collector's items for generations to come. Nan, this podcast is my humble dedication, thank you, and living legacy to your life's work that has helped and changed my life and the lives of countless others around the world 
and will continue to do so with our ongoing devoted support. As Nan is famous for saying, beyond the ugliness in this world is the incredible beauty of love and friendship. That is where I live. And her precious words will help all of us live there with her forever. Thank you, Nan, for taking the time to share your journey. And Freedom Fighters, please enjoy this really special episode with the evergreen Nan Whitcomb. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Today we get to spend some time with someone who has been very close to me for years but doesn't know it. Uh, She's someone who has been there in all the major decisions, all the major situations and all the major things that have influenced my life. That's been my marriage, my unfortunate divorce at one stage, the passing of my uh, loving parents and every time I need to reflect on something important in my life, this is the person that I've turned to. Uh, She's been my muse, she's been someone that's been my confidant and I could only describe her as the soulmate that I've never had the chance to meet until today. So I'm very humbled to be having a chat with Nan Whitcomb. Welcome, Nan. Oh, Bushy, what a beautiful opening to our <laughs> conversation. Well, I, I can't say uh, enough, Nan, how long I've looked forward to the day of meeting you. Uh, in fact, when my good wife, Sonia, uh, blessed me with your words, uh, it would be nearly 30 years ago. And uh, from that day forward, I said to Sonia, one day I want to meet Nan Whitcomb, and uh, so this is a great day for me. Well, I am so thrilled to meet you and your beautiful wife, Sonia. <laughs> I <is>. really am. <laughs> Nan, um, I would love for you to uh, share your life journey with us. And uh, just talk us through, right from as early as you would like to start, uh, what you have invested your time, energy and motivation in and and how has that impacted on you? Well, let me say that uh, everything really starts with my mother and father. Right. How they ever married each other, I do not know. (laughs) But uh, Dad went through the whole of World War I and he tried to get in uh, to the army in 1914. Right. Well, they wouldn't take him. He was too short. So he went back four times. And the fourth time he, he said to them, oh, well, they, they said to him, can you play the bugle? You'll only get in if you can play the bugle. Dad said, oh, yes, I can play the bugle. Of course he couldn't. <laughs> And, and the story goes that apparently um, they, when he was going over on the ship to Egypt to train, yep. uh, he was to, uh, they were just going to crash into another ship and he was told to play everyone to action stations. Well, Dad had just learnt to play Come to the Cookhouse Door Boys. <laughs> so he played that and the ship just floated past the other ship and he always said he saved everyone on that ship. <laughs> anyway, he ended up in the Flying Corps right. and, um, and he only went to school until he was 12. Wow. And he became an accountant, <laughs> which is ridiculous, really. <laughs> and uh, that's what he was when he went away. Yeah. And um, when he came back, he became manager of uh, the Grenfell Street um, uh, Bank. Um, uh, it doesn't it's, – it's no longer with this, this bank. I can't remember what it was now. Was it the, was it the predecessor to the Adelaide Bank? Wasn't the Highmarsh Building Society or no, one of those? No, no. The, no. the Adelaide Bank was the one I went to. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, you're right. But anyway, uh, Dad was made manager of, of this um, bank in Grenfell Street. Yeah. And uh, my mother um, was one of eight children – yeah. And her father was quite a, a wealthy person to do with buildings and things like that. Right. And uh, her mother died when she was only about nine. Okay. And so um, she was brought up by her sisters, and her sisters were not allowed to go out without a chaperone. 
Right. <laughs> Mainly because my grandfather had got his wife, uh, if then, you know, who turned out to be his wife, into trouble. And she was a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been pretty scandalous at the time, no doubt. I would say. And so he, he had to marry her and and then had the eight children and then wouldn't let the older girls go out without a chaperone. And mum didn't want to be an old maid like her sisters. So she went and learnt shorthand and typing. Right. And she got a job in that bank in Grenfell Street. <laughs> And somehow, Dad got her to marry him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge, was it? How on earth he did it, I don't know. <laughs> but anyhow, um, in those days, bank managers were pretty wealthy. Yeah. And we lived in a house uh, always with a grass tennis court and a live-in maid and all those sort of things. Wow. And um, uh, when I was four... Um, I went, did a few months at a, a kindergarten, yeah. uh, but uh, that didn't last very long. And and I went to Girton, and my brother went to King's, yeah. and that became Pembroke. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, throughout our great chat, I'm going to engage you by sharing some of my favourite and most appropriate readings from the thoughts of Nanushka. So let me start here with this one. Guided back by memories to childhood dreams, to secret places hidden in the old pepper tree, knowing if we climbed a little higher, we could reach forever. Building palaces of fronds and ferns, our beds adorned with quilts of stolen flowers. We sent imaginary servants to bring exotic fantasies to eat, and never felt a twinge of guilt as we crushed the lush green carpet beneath our careless feet. With daring leaps we captured rocky islands in a swollen stream. Intrepid explorers or daring mountaineers, the world was an adventure which belonged to us and so we knew no fear. Sometimes I'd take the journey back to find a trace of yesterday. Perhaps a little magic from the past can help us face the problems of today. Then uh, uh, Dad got transferred to Newcastle to be the, the bank manager of Newcastle. Okay. So off we went. I was seven by this time. Right. And when we got there, Dad wanted to, us to have a tennis court because he thought that Peter and I were always going to be um, Wimbledon tennis players. Okay. So... And he was having it built at Bar Beach, which is a toffee so- suburb there. Yes. But in the meantime, we were living in a little rented house at um, – uh, and, and I went to a school called The Junction. It okay. was a state school. Okay. It was the roughest school you'd ever imagine. Wow, big change from Pembroke. And the thing was that um, on the first day there, I was right at the back of the class because my name started with a W. <laughs> and uh, uh, they said, what does your father do to the front one? And went right on. And they all said, minor, minor. They, they were all minors, kids. Got to me and I said, bank manager. And they picked up their pencil cases and everything and threw them at me. Really? Yeah, and the teacher did nothing. Anyway. <laughs> wow, Welcome. I, I didn't I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell the parents or anything. And um, uh, then I eventually I got really hurt. And so they took me away from there and they used to put me on a tram and I'd go into Newcastle, yep. get off that tram. I'm, se- I'm seven years old still. Wow. And g- get on another tram and get to a, a place that was near Bar Beach. Right. And went to the uh, Church of England Girls School. Okay. And uh, I loved it there. It was right. lovely. And right. we eventually moved over and we had the clay court. Of course, you can't have a grass court in Newcastle. <laughs> and uh, and I had little kids uh, to play tennis with me. Yeah. And they were all there one day. And I went in to get the... Um, 
afternoon tea, which the maid usually had put on the trainer bill, you yeah. know, with the lemonade and the and the sandwiches and everything, and. It was there, so mum must have put it there. But I should have woken up the fact that the uh, maid had left about, oh, a fortnight before uh. or a week before. And and uh, so uh, mum said to me, oh, and I looked up and all the furniture in the living room was in great big cases, in big... Huge sort of cases, mm. and Mum said, "Would you like to go and have uh, d- dinner with um, a girl that was trying to teach me to play the piano, which is hopeless because I'm tone deaf." <laughs> and uh, and I said, "Oh yes, you know." So um, I went over there, and she said, "You can take your jammies." <laughs> I took my jammies, and in the morning I woke up, and we were in Sydney. Really? Now, Dad didn't steal anything. <laughs> I think he did what a uh, chap d- did here. He told people what shares to buy. Right. I think that's what he did. Right. And anyway, he got out of the bank, yeah. and, um, and then he we were in Sydney, and we were staying at a very oh, expensive sort of boarding house. Okay. And they sent me to Meriden, which is a... Very toffy school. Right. Mum always found a place that was rather, you know, toffy. <laughs> <laughs> Looking out for a girl. <laughs> she was very clever, actually. Yeah. And um, so I went there for a few months. And, uh, and then uh, we left there and came back to Adelaide. Okay. And uh, then, of course, we didn't have any money at all, I don't think, and we went to Rose Park. Right. Because Mum decided Rose Park was a nice suburb to uh-huh. be in, uh-huh. and I went to the Rose Park Primary School, okay. which I quite liked. Yeah. And one, one Sunday, Dad came home, and he said, we're going for a drive today. We're going to Strathalbyn. Right. And so we got in the car and we went to Strathalbyn and he took us to this lovely hotel uh, which had sort of pine trees going down the back to a creek and yeah. and um, it was the Terminus Hotel. Okay. Well, the next thing is Dad's got the Terminus Hotel. <laughs> but because he was had been bankrupted or whatever it was, yeah. he couldn't have his name on the front. Right. And poor mum had to have her name up on the front of a hotel. She hated it. <laughs> and she used, she used to do the flowers and then she'd, uh, she'd go and play golf at Ashbourne. Okay. And, and anyway, we were there until um, 1939. Yeah. And I went to the primary school. Yeah. And... Uh, by this time, I was in grade uh, seven. Okay, and uh, I was, t- and I went to the high school. Right. For that, la- you know, first year. Yeah. Well, that was in nineteen thirty-eight, I suppose. This next piece always seems to ground me, and it goes like this. I wish I could make you understand there is a whole big beautiful world here ready for us to live in. Not wishes for tomorrow nor memories of yesterday, but now. A billion fleeting moments merging together to make a lifetime. Love this moment and it is forever. I wish I could make you understand. 1939, the war was on, and uh, Dad went back into the army and became a recruiting officer, and uh, and I was put on uh, the Paris Creek farm at uh, at Paris Creek to finish my year. First year high school. Right. So I went there and I remember the lady used to take me in with her daughter um, to the high school and uh, I used to uh, go go back there and do the separating of the milk, you know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I, when, I, when I found um, 
uh, Paris Creek milk here, I started getting Paris Creek milk. You started drinking it. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. And so anyway, the thing was that um, I did that and then I was waiting on the uh, station to go down to Victor Harbour where Dad was in the army as a recruiting officer. Right. And a man came up to me and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just going down to Victor Harbour to to join my parents. And I was thrilled because we used to go there for holidays and stay at the Crown Hotel, you know, in in the the wealthy days. Yeah. And and he said, but they don't live there anymore. I said, oh. He said, don't you move. And he went away and he must have somehow got in touch with Mum. Yeah. And so she came. He changed my ticket and she, she came and uh, picked me up and she'd got us this tiny little flat in uh, Gilberton. Right. Which uh, is a very toffee suburb. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the right address. <laughs> it, uh, it was the back flat in a – and f- there were three flats in the front. There was a tennis court in front of them. Yeah. Grass tennis court. Okay. This is what I say, my mother was so clever. Yes. And the, where we were um, was the kitchen, had been the kitchen. Right. And you walked in the door and you were in the sitting room. Yeah. And if you took the door to the left, it was mum and dad's bedroom. Not that he was there, but this time he was down in the southeast. Okay. <laughs> and uh, still in the army. Right. And... Uh, and then you worked through her door, and it was my room. And you went out of my room, and you're in the kitchen. Yep. And in the kitchen, you went back into the sitting room. Right. And there was a tiny little bathroom off the sitting room. And Peter didn't have a, a room at all. Okay. <laughs> right. He had a bed on the veranda outside. Wow. And if it was raining, he had to climb through my window because he couldn't get, he couldn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> to his bed, otherwise, <laughs> and we were there for um, quite a long time. Yeah. And uh, the other wonderful thing that my mother did was she got me into the wilderness, the lovely wilderness, the school. Right. And I started there, and I must have been twelve, I think, by this time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Miss Mamie Brown, who was the headmistress. <laughs> was wonderful to me, really wonderful. She knew the family were pushing it, and um, right. she sort of looked after me. Yeah. And also, uh, I met this girl called Heather. Yeah. And Heather uh, showed me around the school. I mean, this had never happened before. Okay. Uh, at Meriden, I got snubbed because I was I had the wrong uniform on, and and the other schools I sometimes got beaten up and really you know, well, why was that? or something because you were new or or because uh, you're just the because I was daughter, different or? and I was new and I very often went there in the middle of a term you know yeah of course <laughs> but anyway there was bullying went on then yeah um, so anyhow uh, this friend and I Heather and I became great friends and um, her family. You know, they say that this um, weather change, um, climate change has just come on. But Heather's family went to Oruru and it didn't rain for seven months. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just crazy that they, what they say these days. Yeah. Anyhow, at, at 15, I had had enough. I'd been to nine schools, if you count the kindergarten. Yeah. And I was 15, and I went in the May holidays. I was supposed to be doing – I did my intermediate. I got that. Okay. Supposed to be doing my leaving. So I uh, went in and got a job in the Bank of Adelaide. Yep. (laughs) Yep. And everybody nearly had a fit. Miss Mamie said I'd end up on the streets. (laughs) (laughs) Why why did you feel that way? (laughs) Anyhow, uh, mum was shocked and everything, but at least it took, you know, a bit of uh, trouble from her. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the the thing was that um, I was there until I was 18. Okay. That was nearly three years. Yeah. And Heather got a job 
because her family didn't have any money either. Right. And uh, so she got a job in town in an office. And when I was 18 and Heather was 19, we both started nursing at the children's hospital. Okay. And uh, it was uh, nursing was very, very different then. Was it? Oh, it it would have so been a bit of fun, I'm guessing. You would have uh, uh, played up a bit, I'm, I'm imagining. It was what? You would have played up a little bit, I'm, I'm guessing. Oh, well, we did, you know. <laughs> but we couldn't when we were actually there. But uh, we, we did have a, a lovely, a lovely time. Yeah. But um, one of the things was there was a night sister there. And they called her Pans, Pans who, after bed Pans. <laughs> she was the most frightening woman I have ever, ever seen. She used to wear her her veil sort of down right so you didn't see her hair. Yep. Uh, she wore glasses. She wore no makeup. Yeah. And she would just uh, be there. You'd, the only reason you knew she was coming was you smelt the kerosene. She called it. She always had a lamp <laughs> because she said if you shine a, t- a torch into the kids' faces, it would frighten them. Right. She was a wonderful, wonderful nurse. I don't think a child ever died while she was on night wow. I think they're too scared to. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I can remember one night. Um, one night, she, uh, I smelt the kerosene, and I was in Colton Ward, and uh, I hadn't been nursing for very long. I think it was my first night, uh, night duty. Okay. And I, I saw a shadow on the wall, and in she came, Pansel, and she said she picked up her uh, lantern, and she said to me, "Follow me, nurse." And so uh, I followed her out of the thing. There was the most terrible storm on, and it had just stopped raining, but it was blowing a gale, and our veils were being flown everywhere. Yep. And we went down on the um, the back of the hospital. There was a, a, a lawn that they used to have the fates on. Yeah. And the bottom of there was the mortuary. Right. And against the mortuary wall was a bucket and spade. Okay. And Pans Hill said, pick it up, nurse. I thought, my God, we're going to bury somebody. And uh, she said, follow me, nurse. And <laughs> back we went around the hospital. Still this raging gale going on. It might have been in the night that the, um, uh, the, the Glenelg jetty was nearly washed away. Well, okay. Anyhow, um, she stopped right in the middle of King William Road and said... Pick it up, nurse. And I looked down and all I could see was a heap of horse uh, manure. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I said, pick it up, nurse. So I shoveled it up and put it in the bucket. And back we went and put it against the mortuary wall. Do you know, I didn't, for weeks, I didn't know why I'd done it. She didn't explain why I had no? to do it. What was it? was it? put on her garden. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting you to do the gardening. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, there were so many things that happened at, at, at the um, at the hospital, but on our third year, Heather got polio, and uh, wow! So um, I had just got through as a sister, yeah. so they put me in charge of the sick nurses ward, right? Uh, so I could look after her, right? And she couldn't move at all, and she was on a frame. And, um, you know, and it used to take a couple of hours to feed her with a pipette because really? she d- had no muscles or anything to. And. Um, Must have been soul destroying for you to see that happen. Was to, it? Must have been soul destroying for you to see oh, that it was, change. It was very sad, but um, I had. I, took her up the road where we used to go and play tennis earlier okay. with a friend and I used to take her out on the barouche and uh, and this particular day someone went and gave her a piece of cake and of course she was too polite to refuse it but she had no no way I mean she was almost choking Choke. and I rushed her back to the hospital and they uh, gave her an injection and I stayed with her for um, uh, till 
quite late and they had uh, Pans who unfortunately wasn't there anymore and we had an awful night sister and she came and she said what are you doing here sister and I said I'm just staying with my friend she said you are off duty go and I said I won't go unless you give, give me somebody special yep. so she did she put I think the most junior her nurse in the hospital and about one o'clock uh the next morning i was in bed and there was a knock on the door and it was matron and uh, told me that heather had died and i just uh, went really strange i uh, I, I they let me stay there but i didn't have a ward to look after and um i sort of I don't know. I I can't really remember a lot of what I did, but there were a lot of people who helped me through it. Yeah, there must and have been a lot of anger over that happening, and when you felt that you could probably uh, have saved her if you were allowed yeah, to stay well, with her. No, I didn't even think that. It no? was. It was just the. I just didn't know it was going to happen. That's mm. all. The shock I think, and uh, the shock of it. This next one just seems to sum up the loss that Nan had for that very close friend. And it goes like this. She filled my house with flowers and I helped her look for rainbows. She understood so many things, the importance of laughter and that each moment is forever. She dreamed impossible dreams, smiled at strangers because they might be lonely and loved music, bells and butterflies. I'll think of her on sunlit days and see her smile in every flower. When she was ill and I was looking after her, um, before she was ill, we had decided we would try and get into ANA, Australian National Airways, as air hostesses. Right. Excellent. (laughs) And uh, and actually, uh, Heather, first of all, got engaged... Uh, and so she wasn't going to do it. Right. And another another um, <laughs> nurse, um, she was going to because her sister was in in that. Yeah. So uh, I was invited to have a, an interview uh, with the matron yep. of this um, ANA, and uh, uh I couldn't go because I was looking after Heather. Yeah. After Heather died, I decided I would let them know, you know. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So I did. I was yeah. accepted immediately. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I never flown before <laughs> and got into a DC-3 and went over to Melbourne to do my training. Yeah. Was sick all the way. <laughs> 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 and I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> Got over there and we were put into these terrible places where there were sort of eight of us staying at the one place with one kitchen <laughs> and uh, and no sitting room, oh, no. all these things, and two to a room, sometimes three to a room. Oh, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> but we thought it was marvellous. We just uh, put up with it all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, then I was transferred to, after you finish your training at yeah. those days, yep. you were sent to another state, but not okay. to your home state. Right. So I was sent off to um, uh, Brisbane. Okay. And uh, uh, up there. <laughs> this next one just seems to capture perfectly the loss from a love that couldn't be. I'll fill my nights and days so not to think of you and look up friends I haven't seen in years. I'll read sad books and watch sad films to camouflage my tears. I'll play the clown and drink too much, trying to forget the way your hand caressed a glass or held a cigarette. But in the lonely light of dawn, when dreams are hard to hold, The foolish mask has slipped away. The truth is stark and cold. I'll touch the pillow where you slept, and in my heart I'll smile, remembering you love me. 
for a while. I had been going out with this doctor yeah. and uh, in Adelaide. Yeah. And he uh, was, by this time, ha- he's the only man that I ever really wanted to marry. Right. I had dozens of uh, in- invitations to marriage, <laughs> but I wasn't interested. But this one, uh, he met somebody when he was overseas, I wanted to go with him when he was going overseas to do his gynecological stuff. Right. And um, lucky I didn't. I would have ruined his life. Why? <laughs> because, <laughs> because I like to do so many crazy things, you know. And <laughs> anyway, he went off on this ship and on the ship going over there to do this, he met the lady who he married. Right. And what do I have to do? The first week that I was up in Brisbane, I had to go to their wedding. Oh, no. And I'd never met her or anything. And I thought, gosh, if she gets on the on the plane, I might happen to trip and, <laughs> and spill some coffee on her or something. <laughs> but, but anyhow, um, she... Uh, I saw him walk down the aisle and uh, the back of his neck, his hair, it was just absolutely beautiful, you know, and I thought, I'm never going to be able to stand this. And then we get to the, uh, where they're having the reception, yep. which is where he and his wife still live. Yep. And uh, <laughs> um, he introduced me to her. Right. Well, she took my hand and she said, how could he ever have married me? And I thought, what a beautiful thing to say. Wow. <laughs> she introduced me to all her ex-boyfriends from down south and out west and up north. And, of course, the whole time I was there, I had somebody to take me out. <laughs> <laughs> this one also just seems to sum up that aching loneliness surrounding a love that couldn't be. We knew our love could never be, for like the golden sand, the more you try to hold it tight, the more escapes your hand. The mighty plans of mice and men will often go astray, and what was so a year ago may not be so today. We're born into a changing world, the young too soon grow old, and storm clouds in the summer sky can make the day grow cold. And though our love can never be, for love's like golden sand, you'll know through all eternity that I will understand. The time may go, the winds may blow, and restless is the sea. But you will know I'll understand through all eternity. And then, unfortunately... um my brother, who had been uh, in real strife after being the rear gunner in Lancaster's in World War II, yeah. um, and he uh, had been living at home, and um, I'd sort of, and he'd been in hospital at one stage, and uh, and I used to go and visit him there, and oh, all sorts of things had been going on, and they thought he was going to be all right. Right. And then I got a message from my mother to say, would I please come home because she couldn't handle it. And so I came back to Adelaide. Right. Anyway, um, that from then on, uh, I sort of um, was helping him a lot. Yeah. But then he went to Sydney. Okay. And, and uh, so uh, I... Unf- Rather fortunately, I was al- always able to fly up there uh, and see him, even yeah. even if I wasn't flying there normally. You know? Right, right. Well, eventually, I became the senior regional hostess. Okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, I knew exactly what to do with the girls because I was had been just as bad as they were. <laughs> that, <laughs> there's the, nothing getting past you, Nan. No. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and I became um, uh, sort of very fond of a lot of them. Yeah. 
and there's a, a, a thing going on in Brisbane in May. It was, will be the last, um, probably the last reunion of the Ansett Down to Earth Club. Excellent. Which actually I named the club the Down to yeah, Earth Club. The President Award, you, you pretty much ran that group for quite some time, didn't you? Uh, well, I was President of the uh, South Australian part of it. Right. For about 21 years, I think. Okay. Are you going to Brisbane uh, to celebrate? Well, I hope so. If my leg doesn't do me down the drain. Yeah. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, the time there was wonderful. We had another lady who was in charge of us when we first started flying, and that was Matron Holliman. Right. She'd never been a nurse, but she was called Matron. <laughs> she matron late, was she? <laughs> but she was really... Really a lovely person. Yeah. And uh, I think I think she, uh, her husband actually uh, used to drink a lot. Right. And he was a pilot. He was one of the first ANA people. Okay. Uh, I can't think of his first name now, but he was a Hollyman, one of right. the two brothers. Right. And apparently uh, he was in Melbourne and he... Uh, wanted to go to a a party, apparently, or something. They invited him to go to a party. And he flew back to uh, Hobart or Launceston and then got in his plane with his ordinary clothes and everything yep. and uh, was lost at sea. Right. His plane crashed. And so that was Matron's husband. Oh, dear. And the, then, you see, she... <laughs> She used to warn us about the pilots. She used to say, don't don't get uh, too interested in them or think you're going to marry them because you won't. <laughs> you and she fell for it. Oh, she really, she really used to <laughs> tell us things like that. <laughs> but um, anyway, she uh, eventually um, left and uh, we had uh, an answer lady who and and an a and a and they were both sort of took the matron's position right right one was from ansett and one was from a and a and they didn't like each other oh <laughs> it sounds like fun <laughs> i used to have to go over there and to melbourne uh for meetings and things and one of them would, would tell me all the awful things about the other one and then i'd go into the other one's room and she'd tell me all the awful things and this went on for ages but eventually it all got uh, one one left and and left the other one to it yeah so I just uh, had quite a good funny time, yeah. you know, as a hostie. This next thought again captures our youth's revolution around the importance of love. And this is how it goes. Young, but with the wisdom of forever, peaceful as the quiet beyond the sky, lonely yet sharing in a world of other people, seeing life through other people's eyes, afraid but braver than tomorrow, wondering if what is will always be, borrowing your happiness and sorrow with the unrequited freedom of the free, sad as autumn snowdrift in the valley, eyes with unshed tears too proud to fall, a heart that trusts in love, but not in loving, yet knowing all the while that love is all. And um, then in 1973, I think it was. Yeah. Um, now, why did I leave? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, the thing was, oh, I know what it was. Uh, Ansett, uh, we were going to do things completely differently and I would no longer be doing the rosters uh, and everything was going to happen from Melbourne. Right. And I thought, no, no, it's no longer Adelaide. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so then when um, David Hardy offered me a job as manager of the barn restaurant down in McLaren Vale. Yep. Uh, I said yes. Okay. And I went down there and knew nothing about 
doing uh, managing a restaurant, <laughs> but I did know how to handle the staff. Yes, and um, so I went down there and. Um, Oh, it was it was fun. It yeah. really was. It was. So you were front of house with the, uh, with all the clientele and managing the the team. Is that pretty much what you were doing there? That's what mainly I did. Excellent. Mm. Yeah. No, there was a um, an accountant lady who did all the uh, bookwork. Thank right. goodness, because I wouldn't have been able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but the the rest of it, it was. You know, it was it was lovely, and the, and the yeah. staff down there were just terrific. Yeah, great restaurant. So, um, I did that for about seven years. Okay, and I had already started writing my poetry. Yeah, the thoughts of Nanushka. But, yeah, when did you start the? So that that was before. Uh, before I left being senior hostess, right. and the little tiny books. Uh, that I had one each, like volume one yeah. to, to volume six, yes. were all little uh, little books. Okay. And I had to stop my girls from flogging them to passengers on the aircraft. Right. And uh, I said, look, you can't do this. You're not allowed to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it didn't stop them, though. <laughs> no, it, it didn't stop them much, but uh, I had to stop them. But um, anyway... Um, I used took them down there to um, the barn, yeah. and there was a table there, and I always had them on the table. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so that that ended when David sold it to a family who had everything. They had the manager and the and the chef and the everyone. Yeah, and uh, so I didn't have a job. This next one just seems to capture the never-ending cycle of our lives that feel important to us at the time, but looking back and observing independently, we may think differently. Here's how it goes. People laughing, people crying, babies born and old men dying. The endless circle turns another turn. Ever-changing, colours blending, no beginning without ending. We live and learn, forgetting what we learn. Is it right or is it wrong for us to sing and who's the song for? The endless circle turns another turn. Is it wrong or is it right for us to fight and what we fight for? We live and learn, forgetting what we learn. Loving, hating, joy and sorrow, yesterday, today, tomorrow, the endless circle turns another turn. Like a mist upon the mountain, like a never-ending fountain, we live and learn, forgetting what we learn. So um, I got a call from the manager at 5DN. Okay. And he said, would I like to come and have a drink? And I went and have have a drink with him, and he said, "We've got this fellow. He's not everybody's cup of tea, but we'd like you to do an hour in the afternoons uh-huh. with him." And uh, uh, and I said, "All oh, right. Well, what's his name?" And they he said, "Ken Dickin." <laughs> and I said, well, "We went out and we had lunch. Yeah, a lot of laughs at lunch. I bet." <laughs> and. Um, and then we, we, at the one hour ran, I think, to three hours in the afternoon or two and a half hours <laughs> or something. It's a long lunch. <laughs> uh, eventually, because it became quite popular. Because, and I think it was popular because Ken always pretended that I weighed 22 and a half stone <laughs> and had a terrible drinking problem. <laughs> and no one could understand why on earth I didn't get cranky with him. And, you know, one time... I was sitting opposite him, waiting for the show to start. He said, "Here, well, she's not here today." He said, "We know where she is. <laughs> she's in the Welly next door. That was the Wellington, Wellington. Hotel." Oh, in North Adelaide. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and and I said, uh, uh, I just sat there, and he said, "Well, they said uh, she was crawling around the floor <laughs> and begging for more money for drinks." <laughs> He said, now, if you can hear me, Nanny, he said, you come back here and I'll look after you. Well, then he played a record. And then uh, after the record, 
he looked down at the door and he said, oh, he said, here it is, crawling in. <laughs> he said, and he pretended to help me back into the chair. <laughs> then we started the show. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it was just crazy. <laughs> That's then, been a fun time. And another time, uh, I had to go up to Sydney because to, my brother had sort of disappeared again. Right. And um, he knew exactly where I was. Yeah. Well, I got home and I went into the butchers and the butcher said, where on earth have you been? And I said, oh, I was up in Sydney. And he said, well, uh, Ken Diggin didn't know where you were. And he rang Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> he rang just about every hotel in Adelaide. <laughs> and... <laughs> And, and the Weybridge. At, the at Weybridge. <laughs> because I, I was supposed to weigh 22 and a half stone. Oh, dear. Oh, I said, he knew exactly uh, where I was. a pretty good sense of humor uh, <laughs> to be with a character like that. This next one captures in just a few words a beautiful union. It is a beautiful fact that you and I together can make one hour into a holiday. Unfortunately, after we'd been together for a couple of years, and I think we topped the ratings, actually. But they didn't tell us. <laughs> and they took him away and put him on breakfast. Right. And gave me others to work with. And yeah. it never really worked. The chemistry wasn't right. It just didn't it, feel it right just, after just that. just didn't work like Ken yeah. and I. This next one, again, in a very few words, just seems to capture the cruelness of the corporate world. There are foolish people who make work into a terrible machine, grinding away at life until it disintegrates in the dust of duty. Then I was writing... But this time I was writing Up Here and Down There, which is my book about um, my days... As a hostess. As a hostess, yep. which is more hysterical than historical, <laughs> probably. Lots of parts of it. I, I haven't read and, that, so I can't wait to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, the, the thing was that uh, um, I just... Uh, wasn't making any money or anything much... I was, making, oh yeah, I was making a bit of, of other books. Yeah. But that's when uh, the... <laughs> uh, it's a long story and I won't go into it, it's boring. But um, the, the people who were publishing my books went into liquidation. Out. And they had just taken my house, which is where we are now. <laughs> At this point... In our chat, the next thoughts of Nanushka just seem to capture the moment. You can have money, security and love taken from you, but never experience. And uh, some lovely men who were having to look into all this uh, managed to get them to allow me to stay in my house until somebody could be found that wouldn't charge the earth for rent and everything. Yeah. And which did. That's why I'm still here. Wow. So this, <laughs> but okay. um, the thing is that with, uh, with all that happening, uh, I was still writing stuff. Yeah. And, um, but... Uh, Altogether, I've written volume 1 to 6, uh, 7 to 12, and 13 to 18. Yes. Uh, I have no more volume 1 to 6, yeah. but I have got 7 to 12 and 13 to 18, which I sell to people when they get in touch with me, either on the phone or on, um, on the email. Right, right. And uh, so that's lovely, you know, when I, when I do that. Well, I can well imagine that because I, as, as I said at the start, that your words and your your prose uh, had just have this magic ability to touch the heart, 
And I'd, I'd like to sort of dig into that a bit now, if we can, Nan, because um, uh, and sort of try to understand where the inspiration has come from from a lot of your words. Can you remember back to the the first piece of um, poetry that you ever wrote? Oh, well, I was four years old, four and years I, old. I didn't actually write it. Okay, I just said it. Yeah, and it was little kitty goat went for a float over to the island in his little boat. <laughs> <laughs> I told my, my parents, and they said, where did, where did you learn that? And I said, I didn't learn it. And I it. didn't learn it. I made it up. Wow. <laughs> so, so has it always been, has, has, has capturing your thoughts and words always been just something natural for you? Is that uh, something you've just always done? or? Uh, look, I've, I've written poetry for a long, long time. This next piece is very appropriate at this stage in our chat that captures the poet of tomorrow. Poet of tomorrow, you possess the wondrous fleeting gift of youth. Your life, like pages waiting to be written upon, will soon be filled with tales of laughter, love and lies, of courage, tragedy and truth. Your poems are the beautiful expression of your happiness and tears, your hopes and doubts, your dreams and fears. Let your mind fly free upon a fantasy. Then write softly on the page so you can alter or erase your words and deeds and dreams according to your circumstance and age. When we were living at the little tiny flat, you know, at the back, yeah. I can remember I used to go and stand, uh, sit down by the on the tennis court, yeah, and make up things. I've still got poems that I wrote when I was really? fourteen or fifteen. When I was nursing, I didn't have time really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I was flying, I did. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's been. Uh, a funny sort of a, a life in a way, but you are one who I love because you and your wife Sonia understand my thoughts and can put yourselves in the position that I'm in when I wrote them. Yes, you know? well, and vice versa. I, I think your words have a uh, almost a timelessness about them that. Uh, capture people's feelings at uh, all stages of their life, and and I think those words will will pretty much live on forever, Nan, because they will continue to touch the hearts and souls of people who are looking for solace, who are looking to reflect on their life, mm. who are and and uh, with the the enormous amount of words that you've written, there there's a uh, a poem that captures a, a situation for everyone. This next one is around a subject that I love, and that's freedom. And while it brings freedom to life, it also encapsulates the responsibility that goes with that. And it goes like this. Free as a wind upon the ocean. Free as a bird about to fly. Free as a tiger in the jungle. Freedom, that's the universal cry. But do we cry for freedom without thinking? Like a child wants everything he sees? Do we know that freedom can be lonely? Do we really have the courage to be free? Free as a gypsy in the winter. Free as a bird without a sky. Free as a dolphin without water. Freedom. That's the universal cry. So uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to uh, – So, uh, and I, we talked about this before we, before we yeah. started, but uh, clearly uh, while the, the words are very touching, they're probably uh, not 
all about your particular situation because you'd be 150 if uh, if uh, that was I the wouldn't, case. I wouldn't be just 150. I'd be exhausted <laughs> if, if, the, if the love farms were all about <laughs> that's me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so that, that empathy, that ability to put yourself into uh, someone else's situation, it, it, again, is that are you, are you observing people when you've done that or is that just thoughts no, that come uh, to it you? It just comes naturally, I think. Right. If I like somebody... Yeah. And I'm, I'm watching them on television, and yeah. I like them. Yeah. If something nasty happens to them, I get hurt too. Right. And uh, but people that I don't like on television, I can't. I can't get myself to be uh, in their minds and hearts. Right. I just can't do it. Right. So I'm not one of those people that uh, can go into everybody, whether they hate them or like them or anything. I'm yeah. not one of those. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The, the uh, Even the, the word nanushka mm. has, a, has a romance about it. I just, I just – uh, but when I picked it up for the very first time, the thoughts of nanushka, it, it created this sort of exotic, romantic uh, impression to me. Where, where did nanushka come from? That comes from a, a great friend of mine, Leray Desmond. Right. And uh, Lorraine Desmond, uh, I wrote some songs for her. Okay. Uh, and she uh, was married to a Russian gentleman. Right. And uh, she used to sort of sometimes say, oh, hurry up, Nanushka, instead of hurry up, Nan. Right, because it's And it's that's where it came from. Right. That's where it came from. Because it, it, it's Russian for grandmother, isn't it? Nanushka, is that right? It, Russian for grandmother, Nanushka? Uh, no, it's, uh, Nanushka is, is like saying that, that you really uh, like the person, I think. I think right. that's what it means. Right. Mm. It's a beautiful word. And, and, mm. Okay, so an extension of Nan, Nanushka. At, yeah, uh, yeah. It, 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 it worked very well with Nan, didn't it? Beautifully. Mm. Beautifully, and it, it sort of... You see, you'd be Bushushka. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, love it. I love the way the Russians sort of soften words with the adding an ushka to anything, pretty much. Yeah, that's they? right. <laughs> then, um, uh, so, are there any... Of the work that you've done over the years, are there any that you uh, are particularly touching to you that you would love to share now? and the story around them. You made me see the wonder of tomorrow and how foolish to regret my yesterdays. You taught me how to take my deepest sorrows and use them to build a new today. You told me how success grows out of failure, to have faith in me and everything I do, to live by kindness, honesty and courage, and above all, to my own self be true. I thank you for giving me a world where I belong, where even I who cannot sing can understand the song. I guess there's a, in behind a lot of the, the words, there's, there's a, there's a lot of love, but there's also quite a bit of loneliness. Is, is that loneliness something that uh, you saw in others or that you felt at various times of your life? Probably you should ask that because um, I think it was it, it, not just my loneliness, but it was seeing it in other people as well. Mm. When I wasn't lonely, yeah, and uh, then I could r- write about other people and tell them more or less how you could get over the loneliness. Revolving around love and loneliness, I love how this next one just seems to help us to really live in the moment. What fools we are to miss the importance of laughter, the warmth of understanding and the gift of friendship that wait for us between the extremes of love and loneliness. Yes, and again, you sort of touch the, the heart of the subject, but then there's always hope and, and a, a sort of a, a positive right. completion so that it, it, it gives you the motivation to, to keep going. Which, That's right. Um, which I, I guess, given the experience you had with your brother, who's obviously probably dealt with depression 
uh, for a fair bit of his life by the sounds. Is it, am I right in yeah. saying? Your brother, he he's probably been challenged with depression and and. Uh, oh well, he he was. Um, uh, I don't know whether it was depression. It was almost. Um, you could, you couldn't tell you couldn't tell what he was going to be doing next. Yeah. That's that's all, and yeah. it would have been depression at various times. But yeah. um, he wouldn't show depression as depression. He'd show it as something else. Right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, 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 I would love to share some of your words and then get your <laughs> feelings on it as to when you wrote it and what was happening uh, at the time, if, if yeah. you don't mind. And and these are a random selection, really, because right. as I say, I, I I couldn't. I tried to to bring it down to. Uh, six or seven that I thought were really meaningful, and then I gave up because there's so many that uh, <laughs> I keep doing it. But here's one on on love that I that I'd really like, and uh, I hope I get it with the right enunciation because the the way you phrase it is beautiful. If I love, I will love beyond today, beyond the sensuous tingling of the body, beyond the imprisoned slavery of the mind. I will love freely, as love was meant to be. Like the white wings of a gull on a journey to the sun. Like the wonder of tomorrow and the wonder of a thousand tomorrows with the faith of a thousand yesterdays, which have freed me to love this way. Just beautifully said. I just You read it beautifully. No, I love the beautifully. words. I, I love the well, words. You see, it was when I was actually sort of wondering... Before, after I was, had been wondering whether I would ever fall in love again, because uh, you know I used to fall in love quite frequently. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'll bet you a lot of men fell in love with you as a nurse and the hostess uh, <laughs> well, as well, man. The thing was, though, that uh, I didn't want to marry them. I didn't want yeah. to sleep with them. <laughs> you know, I just yeah. I was in love with them, though. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I I just wondered whether. I would. I stopped doing that uh, at one stage. I just thought this is, you know, this is all wrong. And in in this book that I'm going to uh, change, and uh, because it, it uh, it's called loving you, yeah, and it will be. I'm going to bring it out again sometimes. Awesome. So, and in it, I sort of say how difficult it is to lose somebody. That you loved, uh, uh, that you're in love with, or just love, yeah. And then you wonder if you're ever going to fall in love again, right? And then in that poem, I'm saying, yes, I hope I do, because yes. it's so beautiful to fall in love. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. The, uh, have you always been a romantic? There's a, there's a lot of romanticism that that comes yeah, through. Yeah, I've your always work. been romantic. Yeah, yes. yeah. It's a it's a, a, a Beautiful thing. Here's another one that that uh, actually touched me and and was part of the inspiration for uh, Sonia and my marriage. Uh, uh, and I'll just share this one, Nan. There never was anyone like you. You look at me, and I drown in your eyes. You touch me, and my heart turns over. You excite my mind and fill my soul with peace. Did I really exist? Before you, or was I just pretending to be? Wow. Well, I can't explain that any more than what it says, yeah. and that is how I have felt, but very, very rarely, and I wrote it because that I felt that that's how other people must feel. We, was a someone that that was targeted at the time? Was there someone that you uh, you felt that way about at that time, or no? I wrote it after. Right after. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. But I could still remember it. <laughs> yeah. Well, th- this this one uh, again sort of encapsulates the, the feelings of love, I think, and I'd, and and this one's uh, very touching as well. What is love? Is it a passing fever of the body? which, like hunger, can be satisfied, only, return, only to return again a million times stronger under the guise of love. 
Is it a power over the mind? Tentacles that creep upon the innocent? An insidious phantom stealing unseen and unsuspected upon the willing victim, sucking out life's blood and sapping the will under the guise of love? So what is love? To me, it is a simple thing, tender as the petals of a camellia, yet strong as the roots of a willow tree. Love is truth, and love, unadorned, is what I give to you for what it's worth. Wow. Well, you see, that is just describing what I think of love, and that's why I said I didn't, uh, even if I was in love with somebody, it was a gentle sort of love. There was no going to bed and going <laughs> crazy, like you see on television all the time. I, I never said, that to me is not love. I, I can't get over the way they treat each other. Yeah. But to me, I mean, loving, if you love somebody, you can stroke their cheek and, and kiss them gently on the mouth and not uh, just about swallow them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always think they don't give themselves a chance to love now because the physical side of things just dominates so strongly that there's never an opportunity for the, the true feelings of, of love yeah. to develop. What, what do you think, Nan? Well, you see, I think that is very true because look at the people who uh, in this terrible <laughs> um, married at first sight thing, no, they just letting themselves go. Two of them apparently having an affair with somebody else's husband, and you see, in real life, it does happen as well. Unfortunately, and the thing is that they are just trying to be uh, in that crazy sort of almost attacking each other. That's <laughs> not loving. No. It's just not loving, and that's all there is to it. There's a selfishness there now. That's that, right. That is, that's right. That in, in your words, it's it's all about the feelings of, of the other. That's right. So, uh, which yeah. I think is why it, it touches me so, that there's this caring element to yeah. uh, what you're describing here as... I must say, as I life. have actually uh, said, because uh, it sounds as though I have been in these... Uh, terrible th things, but I haven't. No. Uh, uh, but I've seen them on television and everything. Yeah. And I think, why are you doing that? You know. So, yeah. the way I've said it, it probably sounds as though I've done it. Well, it, that's why I think <laughs> the, the empathy that you have, uh, which is a, a very special quality, I, I think mm. there's very few people who are able to put themselves into that situation. And you must be – are you a great observer? Are you, are you able just to observe people and then encapsulate in, that in words? Is that, is that part of your talent, do you think? Uh, no, I, I don't observe people that I don't know. Right. Uh, really. Uh, but, I, I, I mean, I, d I used to when I was writing uh, the early books. Right. I used to actually go to nightclubs sometimes and sit there by myself and write. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, it's a wonder I wasn't murdered because <laughs> I, I really I had no fear of anybody. You know, I was just stupid. But anyway, <laughs> um, I've forgotten what you asked me now. No, that's good. You're embracing life, which is all that. This one is also very touching to me, and and in in several senses, this one. Uh, when I've lost someone, the, the, there are parts of the words here that that really touch the soul. So I, I, I want to share this one as well. I'll fill my nights and days so not to think of you and look up friends I haven't seen in years. I'll read sad books and watch sad films to camouflage my tears. I'll play the clown and drink too much trying to forget the way your hand caressed a glass or held a cigarette. But in the lonely light of dawn, when dreams are hard to hold, the foolish mask has slipped away, the truth is stark and cold. I'll touch the pillow where you slept, and in my heart I'll smile, remembering you love me for a while. Uh, that's no. really touched me a couple of times. We, we, we lost one of our dogs recently who was very close to us. And just the 
the personal connection there uh, really touched me uh, with him. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about that one and when you wrote that and what it meant to you at the time? Uh, I wrote it a long time after oh. that, that happened. Yeah. But um, I still feel the same about them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I might still, get, yes. Still feel the same about them. Have there, there been loves in your life that, and, and clearly there are, that, that you still have uh, very strong feelings about? Yes. Um, I mean, uh, the doctor that I liked so much, that yes. I, wanted, I wanted to marry. Yes. Well, um, when I go to Brisbane in May, yep. I'll be seeing them. Right. He's still there. Okay. He's now 94 years old. 94. And I'll be 91 in this in May. <laughs> <laughs> and he, the last time I spoke to them, um, he was still playing golf. He'd given up his tennis the year before. Wow. And he was 93 then. Wow. So I've got to ring up and find out how he is and see, see how things are up there. But uh, I went to dinner with them the last time. I was uh, okay. there about six years ago. Yeah. And they're just lovely. Because I thought, now, if if the, he's not happy with her, I might have a go, you see. <laughs> They're so happy. They go out and look at the moon together and Damn. they're just so happy. It's just wonderful to see them. It, it, would he, he be your probably first and, and uh, everlasting love, do you think? Is, is that those strong feelings been there ever since you uh, were keen in from way back when? Uh, I, I still think of him the same way as I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because he was everything. He made me laugh. That was one of the things. Yes, and hardly any of the men I went out with made me laugh, and I couldn't understand it. <laughs> Too serious, were they, man? It. That's why he got on so well with Ken Dickon. He, he was always he uh, made me playing laugh, the fool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 but, uh, he, he was so much younger than me and he was married uh, and then divorced shortly afterwards and then married his uh, his lovely wife who died last year, yeah, the year before. Uh, yeah, that's... Um, so, but he, he's too young for me. I, I could have him for a toy boy, I suppose, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's about 20 years younger than me. <laughs> Age is no barrier now. Uh, and then this, this one's uh, uh, not on love, but I think it just sums up. There's an ability to sum up a time or a, or a place as well in a lot of your words, and I think this one uh, is very meaningful as well. Johnny's got a pocket full of dreams. It's patched, and there are cake crumbs in the seams. To you it may not be a lot, but all the treasure Johnny's got, he carries, carries in his pocket full of dreams. A beetle in a matchbox, a tiny piece of string, some ceiling wax and carpet tacks, a bell that doesn't ring. When Johnny grows to be a man into a world that's tough, he'll soon be told his pocket full of dreams won't be enough. But if he owns a great big car, a swimming pool and yacht, he'll never be as happy as the time when all he's got is a beetle in the matchbox, a tiny piece of string, some ceiling wax and carpet tacks, and a bell that doesn't ring. That was about a, a neighbour's boy years and years ago, and that's he actually did have those things in his pocket. There and, you go. and that made me think about it. And, and did he then have this material success but, but was never really happy because he spent all his time trying to chase it or...? Well, I don't know because I, I didn't know, know him later. No, right. <laughs> but, but again, just sort of... Uh, uh, I love the way it cuts through to what's important in life. Yeah. That the way you've sort Isn't of... Isn't it funny? I haven't even thought of that one for a long time. Right. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I guess this is the, the beauty of your words. That there, uh, there's so many different insights that uh, everyone can be touched by them. So uh, for those listening who haven't uh, had the privilege... And joy of reading the thoughts of Nanushka, uh, I'm really going to encourage everyone to do that. Um, this one as well, and there's a loneliness in this one, Nan. Uh, I chose this way 
no one beside me to share the night or find the day, eating alone in restaurants, reading books I've read before, smilingly declining to join dancers on the floor. My eyes upon the pages, my mind somewhere beyond. You drink your coffee, pay the bill. In a moment, you'll be gone. I wonder if you feel the same. Did I really hope you'd stay? And then I'm glad you didn't, because like me, you chose this way. Mm. Mm. That is was written um, when I uh, used to go to write it. When I was finishing a book, I would go away somewhere where I didn't know anyone. Right. And I would sit at, at restaurants and things yep. uh, by myself. Yeah. And sometimes it was at night uh, and where um, there were couples everywhere. Yeah. And I would just do exactly what I said there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes one person would come up and sit with me. Yeah. But it just didn't mean anything. And I used to think, I think you're the same as I am. You're just doing this. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's amazing. Some some of the places I went, uh, I became friends with the people, you know, and uh, it was amazing, really. Yeah. Do you find, I, I've written my first book last year, which is nothing like what you've done, but it's a very... Uh, it is actually quite a lonely experience because, uh, for me, I withdrew for a long time to actually be able to express my thoughts, and it's very cathartic, but uh, it can be a lonely experience. Is, is that what you found uh, with writing over the time? Or? Uh, writing is a lonely thing. Uh, it has to be. Yeah. If, if it's not, uh, you you get... Mixed up with things. I mean, for instance, say I was going to write something, I would just simply not go out anywhere, or yeah. or have people here, yeah. or anything, yeah. until I'd finished what I was writing. Because as I say, that some of my poems are only six or eight lines, but the thought might have been. I might have written it 30 lines, 20 lines, something. Yeah. And then I have to stay by myself where none of my friends know where I am. Yes. <laughs> or I don't let them in if I'm home. <laughs> uh, and I go through again and again and again, taking everything out, but it's still got, has to um, be what I thought of first. Yeah. That's why I call them thoughts, because yes. they are all just begin as thoughts. Yes. Well, it's funny then. Uh, when I uh, went through school, I didn't like poetry. I love words, but mm. I don't like poetry because there was just the the uh, almost hackneyed approach to poetry, which mm. was all about the, uh, the prose and the rhyme, and mm. but it didn't have the meaning. What, what I love about your words is, is that, you know, we talked about this earlier, Perfection isn't when you can add any more, it's when you can't take anything more away. And I think you have this beautiful ability to distill and crystallise thoughts and emotions in a very few words that just resounds and, and stays with you. So, um, and, and here's another one. Here's one that, is, as you said, it's, it's quite short but, but uh, very meaningful. We do not have to rely upon memories to recapture the spirit of those we have loved and lost. They live within our souls in some perfect sanctuary which even death cannot destroy. Mm. It's just, it just sums it up well, beautifully. Uh, it was a thought that I had and, and, and uh, I eventually made it into a, a, a little poem. Yeah, and it's. I, I think the the mistake that some people can make is that if some of them are, are so so few words, but so insightful that they wouldn't appreciate the work that you've put in to bring it back to that. Like like you say, you might have written a full page and then brought it back to just a few lines, but in the essence of those lines is the is the emotion that people are connecting to. 
So, um, yeah, look, uh, I could go on for hours here, <laughs> man. Uh, I really could. <laughs> I'm sure people will get very bored with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I just love sharing this because it, it really does touch touch the heart and the soul. And But, but there are also some of them that I love, and I'll finish with this one because uh, <laughs> uh, this I'm one here, right, I think is, while it's not about love and loneliness, it's a really good observation mm. about the world, and it goes like this. It's a sad fact that people totally committed to a political project or a religious crusade are often such crashing bores. They repel their converts and can eventually destroy the original seed of their understanding. <laughs> Isn't that true? When did you write Politicians that? Politicians. <laughs> and it's more true today than I think it's ever been. Well, I went out with a, a politician. At ah, stage. you poor thing. Uh, it was <laughs> it was before his second marriage, um, and this is terrible. But you know, I can't remember names anymore. But he was the <laughs> one who started the uh, uh, the religion, uh, not religion, the politics of the. It's just stopped being. Um, what was it called? The Democrats. Ah, oh, yes. Okay. Don Chip. Don Chip. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, I went out with him ah, between marriages. Really? <laughs> yeah, he right. was a lovely man. Yes. And I've written one for him. Okay. Uh, and I can't remember where it is at the moment. <laughs> but um, it, it is about that sort of thing. Yeah. But, and uh, uh, it ends up that I think he was too understanding and decent to be a politician. Yeah. Because he asked me, when he was starting uh, the Democrats, he asked me to go and speak with him at the Adelaide Town Hall. Yeah. And I said, look, I know nothing about um, <laughs> politics. But I said, um, I'll write a poem for you. Perfect. So I wrote the poem for him. Awesome. And read it at the thing. Yeah. And... Um, Whenever he came to Adelaide, he'd come and pick me up and take me wherever he was going. And yep. I even went uh, to the country with him a few times. But um, he was. He, um, he, he was getting cross with the, I think he was with the Liberal Party. He was getting cross with them for some reason. And his son, uh, by uh, his first marriage, yeah. said, Dad, if you don't like what's going on, why don't you make your own? Thing. So he That's made the Democrats. Okay, there you go. <laughs> but they went down the drain too, you see, yeah. after he left. Yes, they did. Mm. He was highly principled, Don Chip, and that, that's a rare quality in a lot of politicians these days, don't you think? Uh, he, he was very highly principled. Oh, that's right. He was. and that's he, he was too high principled to be a politician of, of today's type. Yeah. I think they're dreadful, all of them. <laughs> Except for David um, Spears. Okay. Yeah. He is the same. He is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And um, I just hope that he will always be uh, here because he's uh, for, for black. Yeah. But, and I live in black. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he does things like... He doesn't go to the press and keep telling the press all the marvellous things he's done. He does all these things and he doesn't tell anybody. Yeah. For instance, when I turned 90 this year, yeah. um, I got an invitation to go down to one of the surf clubs down there. Yeah. And apparently he uh, didn't tell the press or anything about it, but everyone who was in this area who turned 90 was invited to go and have afternoon tea uh, and, uh, Excellent. you know, it was just lovely. Uh, yeah. That sort of thing I just I think is wonderful. Well, that, that spirit of humble giving, of giving without uh, ever expecting anything That's in right. return. Is That's a, what he does all the time. Yeah, mm. it's a very rare quality. And, and he looks after the older people. Yes. He has things, like he had a thing down there uh, at um, Seacliff, or Brighton, rather, uh, for older people who were uh, on journeys, who wanted yeah. to travel. Yeah. And he had somebody come and say, 
what was happening now with travel. And I was thrilled because um, knowing that I haven't been away anywhere for ages and going, hoping to go to Brisbane in May. So, and I thought he didn't he didn't advertise this. He yeah. just. Yeah. Sent the invitations out. Right. Is that See, right? See, this is the thing. It's yeah. just so good. There's a selfless uh, approach there, which is absolutely quite rare. And then uh, you've had a, uh, clearly had a very rich and enjoyable <laughs> uh, journey so it's far. It's been a weird life. A weird say. life. <laughs> if you were talking to someone who's, say, just leaving school, and about to embark on their their journey, what what would you be suggesting they invest their their time and energy in? Well, it depends on how they went at school, <laughs> and whether they got on with other kids at school or whatever. But I think that when they're leaving school, I think they should be before they leave. They should be deciding which way they want to go, yeah. unless. They are being perhaps ignored by their parents or something and and they they feel they just want to get out and do something different. Well, that's fine. Yeah. But it depends on the person. I mean, some people don't want to just get out and go and travel somewhere and try and get a job and all that stuff. Yeah. Some of them are not like that. They would want to find out what they're going to be good at, what they're going to train for, yeah. and all those sort of things. Yeah. And um, I think it's very good when kids, when they're still at school, and they say 15 or 16, and they get jobs, say, done at Foodland and at things um, yeah. after school. Yeah. And I think that sort of thing is very good. It yeah. shows them what it's like to work and, yeah. and um, gives them a bit of, idea I've, i have a neighbor yeah. uh or neighbor a couple of doors down and she has two sons who have been working uh, like that at foodland and they are so good you know they're really good awesome and uh and i just think that's pre- perhaps what would be the best thing to do yeah okay and, I mean, I left school and went straight into a job. Yeah. But that was a full-time job for, yeah. for nearly three years. Challenging time. Mm. You're, if you look back on your life so far, what, what are the, the, the learnings that you would like to share with people on, on uh, qualities or, or things that you think are well, important? Well, look, I've got a, a poem here. It's in volume 7 to 12. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know whether I can uh, find it. Find it very quickly. Perhaps uh, if you give me seven to twelve. Yep. And um, I wrote it for Miss Mamie and all those people. Yeah. So perhaps you could read another book, uh, one of my poems while I'm just looking for it. What do you think? Yeah, that's a very good idea. Uh, there's so many to choose from that I struggle to uh, to pick the best ones. But uh, uh, th- this one I think is quite poignant as well. In me, there is an exquisite loneliness, deep and personal, like unbearable pain. I made friends with it and found peace. W- was that one that was uh, relevant? To you personally, Nan? Uh, yes. Sort of. <laughs> it's very hard to sort of say. Uh, and it's very hard to say what I actually do and what I don't do. And I think I'm not going to find this thing. Can't find it? It starts off, he taught me how to... Ah. Oh, no, that's you told me of a white flower. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'll have to leave it. That's okay. Um, but um, the one that I've written in the front of this book, which is going to come good eventually. Yes. Shall I Let's just that. read that? It's very short, but it's what I think. Yeah. And it is, uh, and it applies to you and all the other people that, uh, 
that understand my thoughts. Yeah. Now, Nushka lives within each of us, belongs to everyone, and yet to no one. Perhaps Nanushka is part of you. That's, I think, a beautiful place to finish our discussion today, Nan. It's been uh, uh, an absolute pleasure for me to have this opportunity to spend some time with you. It's something that I've been wanting to do for many, many years. So uh, I feel quite blessed that Sonia and I have had this opportunity to spend some time. I'd, I'd love to be able to do more of it. And I'd love to bring your words to uh, the joy of others who, uh, in all the important times of life, you have a, uh, a way of making their heart sing. Thanks for your time well, today. Well, thank you very much, Bushy, because I now have two friends who I know will be friends forever, and that is you and Sonia. Thank you very much. Awesome. To complete this awesome chat with Nan, I want to finish on some words of optimism and a vision of a world that I would like to live in and one that Nan just paints perfectly. Please let me live where honesty is a way of life and people smile, then offer you their friendship without guile, where strangers find a welcome and no one feels alone, where I am loved for being me and not for what I own. These pieces that we've shared with you today are really special and really touching. So again, I encourage any of you who think you could find some solace, some warmth and some insight in her wealth of words to reach out to me. And there's only a very small handful of her books left in existence, but they are there for you if you'd like one. So it's first in best dress, but please reach out to me by my email, bushy at khgroup.com.au and I'll be very pleased to put you in touch with Nan to enjoy a very special copy. Thanks, Freedom Fighters. We'll talk soon. Well, Freedom Fighters, how good was that? To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au That's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au Or check us out at www bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast so thanks for listening and as always dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die tomorrow